This is the Outlook for Farmland Prices and Rents webinar. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. We'll talk about the results of the Illinois Society of Professional Farm Managers Survey. Our panelists for the day include Gary Schnicki, uh, along with Luke Worrell. Gary, of course, is with the University of Illinois, and Luke is with Worrell Land Services. Bruce Sherrick is out of the office today, so will not be filling, uh, will not be on hand, but Gary will be ably filling in for him. Gary, thanks so much. We appreciate that. Uh, and good morning to you. I believe you'll take us through the next several uh, slides for the day. Yeah, yes, I will, Todd. And you, you're you out at the Farm Progress Show, so keep it, uh, keep the lid down there. Uh, Luke Worrell and I will lead you through uh, your, our farmland price outlook. And what we want to uh, do here today is cover five topics. First is farm, farmland prices up till now. So we're releasing the Illinois Society of Professional Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers uh, uh, mid-year survey today. So we will give you the results of those in uh, items two and items three, farmland prices and cash rents now, and then five years from now. And then fourth, we'll come back and ask, can it last? And finally cover some cash rent and rental arrangements. To get us started here, before we give you the results, we have a poll question. We're launching the poll here and we, we'll get your gauge. So what do you expect farmland prices to do in the last half of uh, 2020? So if you wouldn't mind taking, taking that poll, we'll get your opinions and then we'll give you some results of some surveys that we've seen around the around the U.S. mainly focused here on uh, ma mainly focused here on in the Midwest. Then we will go directly into the Illinois Society of Farmland Farm Appraisers. And by the way, we made a small error on this poll. We want to do 2021, not 2020. So we're still a little behind on our polls here. Somewhat confusing when you're talking 2020, 2021, 2022. Who who knows where we're at right now? So we will thank you for answering our poll. So we will take that up. We will show you our results here. As you can see, you're, most people here think that we will increase more than 3%. 38% increase less than 33%, 41% stay the same as 15%. We'll keep Euro's numbers in mind as we're going through this, and we'll show you what the Illinois Society members thought. So there's, a, there's your thoughts, and let's just go through, through farmland prices up to now. And what again, there's been a number of studies that have been released here recently that have looked at farmland prices. We're going to go through some of those. And then, then, then Luke is going to give us the results from the Illinois Society effort. Last, uh, or last month now, very early in the month, there were USDA release of what they thought or what their survey of farmland values were. You can see we have Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana there. Uh, according to the NAS, National Agricultural Statistical Service, Illinois had a land price of 7,900. That was up, and all three of those states were up from 8 to 9 percent from 2020 to 2021. Uh, that, that, that survey is done in er, giving results in June, so those are sort of year over year over June values. So up 8 to 9 percent from 2020 to 2021. That was the NAS survey, giving levels from for, for the state. Here is what the Illinois Society released earlier in the year, and they do that for excellent, good, average, fair, recreational and transition farmland. Luke, a little bit later on, will provide updates on the excellent, good, average, and fair categories. And again, Illinois Society does that for regions across the state. This is uh, region one is in the northeast all the way down to 10, which is in the uh, southern part of the state. These values that you're seeing on this slide uh, were for the beginning of 2021 or end of 2020. Uh, and as you can see there at that point in time, across all regions, excellent quality of farmland had an average price of $10,695 per acre. 8,400 for good and 6,055 for average and 5,000 for fair. And all of those numbers 
were up from the year earlier levels or from 2019 to 2020. Again, that was released in March and re represents what was happening up till 2021. Um, recently in May, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, David Abendahl's effort up there released the ag letter. And there you can see that they were looking at January 1, 2020 to April 1, 2021. They for Illinois were showing up 2% and then from April to April over year over year levels 4%. So again, you're seeing a trend here, NAS, um, uh, Illinois Society and now Federal Bank we're showing, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago we're showing values rising and this, this again was for April 2021 um, levels. So that gives you a feel for what those look like according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Purdue released their study of land values for 2021 and they had their land classes top average poor. Um, they saw from December 2020 to June 2021 an 8% increase for top quality land, 7.6% for average and 7.8% for poor quality, poor quality farmland. Against those are Indiana values, uh, just just next to Illinois. So um, um, again, we see prices up. That was from December 2020 to June 2021. So a very good increase or pretty large increase uh, from that survey according to Purdue University. Finally, just setting this up, Farm Credit of Illinois uh, does their benchmark averages as, and they do that every year from uh, July 1, generally trying to value those at July 1. You see the points uh, of where those farms are located in their southern Illinois, southern and central Illinois uh, region for, uh, for where, the, where, where, the, where their lending activities are. And as you can see, they divide that out in 1A, 2B, and 3C central and 3C southern, and all of those, uh, those, all of those values uh, did go up again. And, average of 8.4 percent and that uh kent reed is the chief appraiser there a member of the illinois society actually on the the board of directors and that was as of august 2021 all of those uh lead lead us to say that farmland prices are increasing now we're going to go into illinois society values and this was a survey done, and Luke Worrell's going to give us more information on that. So take it away, Luke. All right, Gary, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know, a couple quick, quick comments before we really dive into what has been a crazy uh, first half here of 2021. Um, our, our results uh, show uh, some pretty uh, striking numbers. And uh, that will likely carry in into 2022 and beyond and certainly affect the 2022 cash rents. Um, before we dive in, obviously, it, it goes without saying that we need to thank everybody in the uh, Illinois Society of Professional Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. Um, you know, it's, 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 we're slowly but surely approaching our 100-year mark here. It was founded in 1928. We've grown to a membership of over 350 active members and friends, and countless uh, of these professionals from north, south, east to west played a role in helping us, uh, you know, kind of accumulate this data and then, you know, make it to what it is uh, for, for you guys to use in your everyday line of work. Um, if you want to go back and see what our previous uh, results were, uh, you can find what we released in March there at the uh, at the website. Um, and of course, with the obvious disclaimer that a whole lot has changed <laughs> since we since we poured ourselves into this publication. Uh, but if uh, if you do want to go back and use this as a reference material, it certainly is available for you. Um, m moving on, if 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 there's anybody who, who doesn't know kind of how we how we classify land, this is it. This is our scale of, of how we uh, deem what is excellent, good, average, or fair. Um, for today's purposes only, we uh, our survey dealt with uh, tillable productivity, or productive acres, I should say. So um, while we eagerly uh, await to see what has changed with recreational tracks and transitional tracks, uh, today's findings will deal with uh, those first four categories, the uh, class A, B, C, and D soil types. 
Um, so we're going to get started into the good stuff now. And, um, you know, just uh, obviously these are striking numbers. I will say, and, and Gary and I were at the Farm Progress Show yesterday and uh, kind of given uh, some, some highlights and some snippets, but we're going to get into some of the details here today. But in general, in the first half of, of 2021, across all classifications of land, our survey showed that Illinois farmland values have, have risen 20%. Um, to put that in perspective, only four times in the last 51 years uh, have we seen jumps of this caliber. So we are in uh, rarefied air. And uh, you, right now at this slide you're currently viewing is excellent or class A farmland. And in unsurprisingly, this is, is typically always going to carry the flag for farmland values. This is the classification that is, always seems to have a market um, and it's usually just a matter of how much can the class B, C, and D ride the, ride the tailwinds here of class A. You'll notice some enormous gains uh, across the central portion of the state, but certainly none of these numbers are anything to scoff at. Uh, region 5, as you can see, a huge jump. Region 4 and 6, also 20 plus. Um, so, so pretty alarming. It, 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 honestly, and we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit too, it should be noted that this survey was, I believe, through July. And so things are moving so quickly that it honestly is kind of hard to catch up uh, and, and stay up to date. Uh, but we'll get into a little bit more of that later. But um, and again, the disclaimer that this is not uh, we're not trying to uh, shun our friends in region eight, nine and ten. But the different classifications of soil, uh, some of these are only found in certain parts of the state. If you're moving on to class B or good quality farmland, again, um, huge jumps. Uh, again, four, five, and six, uh, right kind of that central to east central portion of the state has really seen the largest jump uh, of any regions, uh, according to our survey. But certainly 10% is nothing to scoff at, which is what you can see up there uh, in the northwest corner of the state. So uh, good quality farmland is keeping pace uh, and also showing uh, huge improvements. Um, moving on to average quality. Um, you start to see uh, on the next slide here, you'll start to see more of the, uh, of the regions uh, jumping into the fray here with average quality farmland. Uh, and it's more of the same. And in fact, I thought something that was incredibly interesting uh, that does not happen all the time is we see some of the biggest jumps here in this classification of land. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll see the biggest jumps with Class A, but, you know, what this kind of shows us is that just land in general, whether it's A, B, or C, uh, is on the way up. And uh, the fact that all of these classifications of land is contributing, you know, is, is what has led us to that overall 20% increase across the entire state. Um, you know, I've been, I've been involved with this uh, venture in a number of capacities for a long time. I don't believe I've ever seen a 35% increase uh, in anything. So <laughs> you region three, you can see there's 35%, region four, 32%. Um, just enormous numbers, and uh, I think that's very telling that uh, all classifications of land are, are rising right along with the Class A stuff. Uh, with fair quality farmland, which is the next slide, um, they're simply, this is always one where, for, for one, um, you know, speaking for Region 7 specifically, we just don't have much of this, this type of soil, and so there, there are always uh, some holes, but even so, you'll see uh, that anywhere from 6 to 23% to jumps uh, in this classification uh, of farmland. So as you can tell, um, it has been, uh, I think, you know, surprising is an understatement, I guess. You know, I think we expected increases. Um, you know, me personally, I think we were, we were a little surprised to see 20% across all classifications, which just speaks to the, the, two tr the true strength. Uh, of the market right now. Um, obviously, when you're talking land, then you want to know, so who's, who's buying and who's selling? And, you know, that looks fairly similar to how it has uh, in, in similar years. If we move on to the next slide here, you know, you'll notice buyers of farmland continue to be growers, 61%. Um, and then individual investors, you know, I kind of look at that as, you know, what I quote unquote kind of call local money. Um, maybe not growers themselves, but but local individuals who have funds to invest. So, you know, eight out of 10 farms, you're still seeing bought by either local growers 
or investors. Um, you know, we obviously do see institutional investors at 8% and, and non-local investors at 11%. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, and it will be very interesting to see how much they participate as these land prices continue to soar. Um, you're, you're looking at sellers of farmland, and, and unsurprisingly, if you're in the industry, you know, a, a state and post-state settlements, um, you know, unfortunately, people people do pass away, and, and a lot of land is being inherited by sibling sets of, uh, of a baby boomer generation, and a lot of times they are not um, uh, local anymore, or perhaps don't have a strong sentimental attachment to the farm, and that is a, a big reason as to, to why a lot of farms do indeed sell. So not surprising there. Um, you know, farmers make up 17% of the sellers, and, you know, it's hard to really dig into this and know exactly why that is. Uh, it could be a number of things, whether it's uh, financial duress or um, potentially just some shuffling of the deck, uh, selling one farm to, to fund another purchase through a 1031. Um, you do see some local investors, institutional investors, uh, and uh, non-local investors chipping in here, but really this, this slide did not surprise me a ton as you still see a lot of local buyers and uh, estate settling as the main uh, driver to farmland sales. Moving forward, we did ask, this is very similar to what we just asked you guys, but we asked the, uh, the survey respondents, and as you can see, this is very, this is quite interesting that not a single person who participated in the, uh, in the survey suggested that we would see a decrease. 45% um, said less than 3%, 33% said more than 3%, and 22% said stay the same. Um, I touched on this yesterday at the Farm Progress Show uh, on Tuesday. Um, there were three auctions in three different counties, and they all went incredibly strong. Uh, there was a sale in DeWitt County, I'm told, went for 17.8, one in McLean County for 17, and one in Greene County at 16.4. Um, keep in mind that this survey was completed there in July, so you know it, it takes more than three sales to definitively give a trend, but I see it continuing to increase more than three percent, at least in the short term. We are entering that time of year where you do see a lot of sales take place. I think October, November are going to be extremely interesting uh, as we see more and more auctions uh, hit the newspapers and, and hit the public. I think we're going to have a really good indication of how, uh, how much strength, how, how much legs are left to this jump. So obviously, you talk about, you talk about, <laughs> you talk about rents uh, when you talk about uh, farmland values. And so this is another poll we're going to do. Um, what do you think will happen to cash rents in 2022? Increase more than $15 per acre. Increase between 1 and 15. Stay the same. Decrease between 1 and 15. Or decrease more than 15. We'll give you a second here to, to chime in. And and while we're doing that, we have one question, or we have more than one question. But here's a question that uh, that pertains to what you just talked about, Luke, and mentioned in the previous four times land values have increased at this level. Was there a pullback in prices? And the answer to that is no, not always. A uh, couple of those times happened uh, right on in that mid. Uh, 2000 to 2012 period and you know during the ethanol build when we said higher prices that's when we saw higher land prices and you wouldn't say that they pulled back the other time we saw large increases was in the uh, 70 or late 70s and early 80s and I guess you would say there was a pullback not necessarily immediately after the high increase years and by the way we're I'm not not suggesting that we have the 80s situation here but there was that that period as well but those those increases did not happen right before that so um we're still doing the poll luke and we're yeah here we, yeah we got we got the results in and uh 46 percent uh nearly half of you said that it will increase more than 15 dollars an acre and around 48 percent Still sees an increase, but between one and fifteen. So near, nearly everybody uh, suggests an increase, um, and you know that's essentially what our poll showed as well. Um, you know, uh, when this was taken in July, our, our average across all classifications of farmland, they indicated that they expected an increase of around eleven percent 
um, for 2022 to 2021. As we just discussed, there continues to be some some strength even since this survey was taken. And uh, certainly if that continues, which I believe it will, um, you know, I would not be surprised at all to see that that number uh, truly be higher when we have the time to uh, to really give 2021 a full the full service here uh, next year, next March, when we are at our event and we're looking back. Um, I would not be surprised at all to see that 11% be higher than what it is here in the first half of the year. Um, real quick, before we, we move on to just to touch base on that question, that's a great question. It was one that was asked uh, yesterday. And really, if you recall, you know, we saw that big jump, uh, you know, about 10 years ago or so. And then from 2015 to 2019, it wasn't an immediate pullback. I would almost define it as a as a gradual softening. It seemed like we would, you know, lose two to five percent uh, a year for for a number of years, and now we're we're riding things back up. Um, moving on, to some other expectations that were asked of our of our crew. Um, expectations for what the the overall marketing price would be for for grain here in 2021. Uh, Twelve dollars and fifty two cents for soybeans and $4.86 for corn. Um, and we're gonna to touch on this just a bit, but uh, people saw low amounts of inflation and modest increases in interest rates. Um, so certainly if you're a farm manager uh, like I am, it's very nice to see uh, those numbers as opposed to what we saw just a year ago when we were marketing uh, corn and beans that was nearly $3 and around 8.30. So pretty, pretty quick turnaround. Um, moving on to the next slide, it, it's tricky these days to predict five months from now, let, it, let alone five years from now, but we, we, did, we did give it our best effort. And um, when we uh, surveyed our respondents, uh, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, expectations for, for farmland prices, uh, over half suggested a 1% to 10% jump, 16% said higher than 10%. 16% said lower, 1 to 10, 10% stayed the same. So, um, you know, overall, I would say a majority of people uh, saw kind of a, a moderate build or some, some, some moderate strength, and about a quarter uh, of people thought it, you know, could potentially be decreasing from where we are right now. Um, so then looking at cash rents, Unsurprisingly, on the next slide, you'll see very similar. Uh, you know, 51% suggested higher values of 1% to 10%, and coincidentally, 51% said higher cash rents, 1% to 10%. Um, and so that obviously goes hand in hand with expected farmland values. On the next slide, looking at, looking at what we expected um, to be the, the price you're marketing beans and corn at five years from now, it was slightly diminished from what the 2022 expectations are. Um, you'll see 1158. That's about a dollar less than what uh, respondents thought we would be marketing it for here. And then 34 cents uh, to the downward at 452 for the expected corn price five years from now. Looking at other risks to the market, um, on the next slide, you'll see that 57% uh, saw a moderate amount of inflation. Uh, 14% said a low amount in inflation, and about 30% of us thought that uh, inflation could definitely be a problem over the next five years. Uh, obviously, something to look at, um, and uh, it'll be fun, uh, perhaps, <laughs> to go back in time and, and, and see how we did uh, on these expectations. Um, interest rates, obviously, on the next slide is also a big question mark anytime you're talking about land values. Um, and interest rates, 41% said increased 2 to 5, 57% said a less than 2% increase, and 2% stayed the same. So I think the takeaway here is that no one really foresees an explosion in interest rates that could, you know, effectively cut, cut the legs off of this, of, of this rush. Um, you know, in, in, in closing on my portion uh, of, of, the, of the webinar here today, um, I, I personally, even though I was around 10 years ago, it's, it, it's hard to, to think of a time such as this, um, considering where we were just a year ago. Um, one of the questions that was asked often yesterday is, so, so what's the catalyst here? And I'm not sure there is one huge catalyst that's doing this. I think it's, it's, it's kind of the perfect storm of scenarios. 
I think you continue to have low uh, low interest rates, so your 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 purchasing power is still historically strong, as opposed to what you know what had been seen in the past from a lending perspective. You have strong commodity prices. We obviously are at levels now that we haven't seen for some time. Um, we're also in a great deal of uh, uncertainty, and and we've been there for 18 months or arguably longer, and Anytime you see uncertainty, you you do historically see a little bit of strength to tangible assets such as land. Um, I also think, you know, our numbers in March showed that we had fewer transactions in 2020. So people who wanted land in 2020 still want land in 2021. And so there's good old fashioned su supply and demand factoring here as well. So I think there's a number of issues. I don't think, or I shouldn't say issues. I think there's a number of factors that have led us to this place. And I don't think one thing can can take credit for this for this run up. Um, throughout time, most farms sell October to February. Historically, there are certainly exceptions, but in between crops is when you see uh, a lot of farms sell. And uh, I certainly see a lot of auctions being advertised and land for sale uh, coming up. The next few months is going to tell us a ton. Um, I think it's really the next few months is going to be incredibly important and set the table for what 2022 is going to look like. Are we going to settle in uh, or are, are we going to continue to, to run up? It's, it's hard to say at this point, but uh, keep a close eye on auctions in your area uh, in October and November. Uh, that's, going to be, uh, that's going to be a great tell. Um, getting back real quick, we're going to take one more poll here before I turn things back over to Gary. Uh, what is your expectation for the U.S. economy in five years? Robust, strong growth, moderate growth, no growth at all or stagnant, one contraction like 2008 and then growth or crash and low? <laughs> so we'll get, a, we'll get a feel for what our, uh, what our, um, what our uh, audience thinks about their economy here and uh, and uh, go from there. See how optimistic or pessimistic, uh, pessimistic we are. You know, to summarize a bit of Luke, if see see if you agree with this, our our sir, our society members would would be overall reasonably optimistic over the next five years. Nothing that I would say they exp don't expect the growth to continue like we've had, but they're not looking at the large declines either and their expectations of prices are higher than they were from 2014 to 2019 so and that that would be for 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 corn and soybeans so let's see what you all say as as far as our economy uh robust strong growth six percent moderate growth 43 percent no growth and stagnation 18 percent and 25 percent of you are uh are I think we'll see something like 2008 and then growth. And then seven of us think, some percent of us think we're going to have a depression, I suppose. So there you go. Um, Gary, can, go I ahead, ask, can I ask Luke a quick question before you go sure. on about, about the price of farmland and those sales that you talked about? I saw those earlier in the week that were around 17,000. Uh, are those investment sales? I think one maybe was and the other one maybe wasn't. And that surprised me. Yeah, so I, I know one was an investment sale, and uh, personally, I know that the Green County one was a was a local uh, a local grower. Um, so I guess that's a sign that both both uh, both are willing and able uh, to 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 swing that kind of swing that kind of stick at prices. I think you know it'd be one thing if it was all investments or all local, but you know I think we have a wide variety of potential buyers out there and. When it comes down to it, there is a lot of money in the market right now, and I think that bodes well for uh, any highly, you know, a high percentage of tillable acreage. Any farm that's going to sell here in the next few months, I think those uh, folks and brokers are going to be uh, going to be happy. <laughs> I agree, uh, Gary. I guess it's time for you to move on. Yeah. So again, what we're looking at, uh, lo looking at, uh, looking at is can it last now um and uh you know so so we're we're thinking about the the the, the longer term the five-year 
um, five year five year outlook and we've seen here a question are we repeating the mistakes of the 1970s and I suppose that they're saying the well, I know what they're saying they're saying we saw large increases in 1970s and then we saw the financial crisis in agriculture in the 1980s the one thing that I would say say say, uh, say about the 1970s is that there is one difference and that is that we saw, saw a large build up in debt in agriculture. Uh, we saw a lot of people buying assets um, with debt and getting some reasonably high debt to asset ratios. We do not see that now in, a, now in agriculture. If anything, debt to asset ratios are coming down. Obviously, you could argue that part of the reason the high debt to asset ratios are coming down is because of the higher asset values and we still do see debt growing overall but the debt to asset position is is coming down and we've in the past year uh, seen actually strengthening in the financial position so if anything you would say that individual farmers are not using debt to leverage themselves so that is one difference from now to from the 1970s to now but it is also true that we are uh, pumping a lot of uh, funds in this this economy, and also building building up some debt levels. And will that uh, will that have some impact on the financial financial assets, and in particular farmland? If I were looking at those the, these questions, can it last? Some of the things that we 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 would we, we would see f moving forward. We get a lot of questions about potential tax changes and will that uh, have some impacts on long-run land prices. The literature, the academic literature on taxes, impacts on assets is, is mixed at best. Um, um, largely, you would expect those to have an impact on timing and not of sales, et cetera, and perhaps not so much on commodity prices, although we are talking about some potential large tax changes, which again, would not be good for agriculture and passing on assets to the next generation, but may not necessarily have an impact on asset values. We also have to be looking at commodity de demand and uh, our survey result, re re our Illinois Society members have an expectation of 452 corn, 1148 soybeans moving forward. And can those last? And obviously that's going to depend on uh, several things. One of those though is China. Will it continue to, to buy our exports? And right now you, you can only think of that, and there may be others, but you can only think of that as the continuing driver of demand. And then will Brazil, and other countries have acreage responses. Um, you get concerned about fiscal and monetary policy, and in particular, inflation. We do have inflation right now. And uh, whether that's transitory or will come back down um, it is a question. And that inflation comes down to the question of, with inflation, will we see rising nominal interest rates? And that, again, would be a concern for our land values because you could make an argument that nominal declines in nominal interest rates have had as much to do with uh, farmland price increases as have had our commodity demand. Just to review here, and this also goes back to the question of the 1970s, here's what the 10-year constant maturity treasury rate has done. We hit our highs there in... In, in this series from in September 1981, 15.84%. This was during the period where uh, Paul Volcker was the head of the Fed and we began uh, our efforts to rein in inflation. And as you can see there, since that point in time, uh, we have been on a downward trajectory on, on, on interest rates. Um, obviously bumpy but overall down on august 10th 2021 we had a 1.36 percent rate which uh from a historical standpoint isn't as low as it was in the early part of the part of the year it's risen somewhat but still those interest rates are ex at very low levels so 
those low levels uh, are, if you think about assets, uh, low interest rates make debt financing of those assets easier, and it also indicates that the alternatives, particularly debt instruments, um, don't have as uh, have as good as return as one would expect, and and would would lead to asset prices in increases. And farmland would be a prime one of those. Although this would impact all asset prices, including stock prices, stock market prices, etc. So overall, those lower interest rates uh, have been been having an impact on asset prices and in general that lower de decline the decline over time would have been uh, putting upward pressure on asset prices and farmland in general so you get concerned about that in uh, can we maintain that lower interest rate moving forward particularly given uh, what we've seen public debt do and and setting this up a little bit you know we've 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 been since 2000, well, we've been since this entire period, except uh, during the, 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 the mid um, 1970s, mid to late 1970s, building public debt. So this would be um, primarily federal debt. Uh, and as you can see, that has been building over time. And we've got two measures here, the aggregate level, and the total public debt as a percent of gross GDP. That, that public debt as a percent of GDP was running around 10% up and higher and lower than that up to about 20, 2008. Then it took off and we then had a bigger increase again in the re most recent year that last, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke there, 40, 40, 40% from uh, up till 2008. Then we had a large increase there uh, in 2008 and another large increase there in, in last year. And that last year's increase was a lot of the spending that was due to uh, corona, coronavirus and efforts to uh, um, keep our economy on an even keel. As you can see there now, we are at a, uh, at, at a, at a, at a high level, so that where our public debt is 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 at a, a at a at a at a much elevated level than it was in the past. That so far has not caused any issues. Um, and just to give you a feel for that, we're showing interest on that debt as a percent of GDP. And as you can see there, we haven't seen rises in that, uh, that percent of GDP, um, and it's still relatively, even, even in the 2000s, it's been, 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 been not rising at a relatively low level, at least since the 1970 period. Um, low levels, and the reason why it's low is because of those low interest rates. So if we have rising interest rates ever, um, we would have an issue associated with public finance. We would see that percent of GDP, interest as a percent of GDP go up. And so the point of that is, is that there's going to be a lot of public policy interest in keeping those uh, interest rates low, as low as possible. And again, as, as I looking forward, um, some sort of interest rate environment that would cause that to rise would would be the impact would be the item that would have an impact on uh, on on land values as much as that uh, impact of lower commodity prices leading to lower returns. Again, if you're looking at where we're at, one of the ways that we often look at look look at farmland prices relative to capitalized value is take cash rent, divide it by a ten year constant maturity rate, that item that we've been looking at here recently. And here we give an example where we come up with a capitalization rate of $7,500 per, per acre with a 225 rent, 3% in a 10 year rate. We're below that 10 year rate. We're below above that on a cash rent right now. But here, 
if you're looking at where capitalized values are relative to farmland prices, the, 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 there, there are two kind of key periods. The 1980s, and again, we keep coming back to the 70s and 80s, we had farmland prices overvalued and we had a high rising interest rates. And at that point in time, the capitalized value was below the, below the price. And then we saw that dramatic decline in, in farmland prices in the 1980s. Right now, we have capitalized values well above farmland prices. And again, that just suggests that given where we are at fundamentally, um, we're not looking at a, at a problem. So that doesn't really answer your question about whether where we'll be at in five years from now. But, um, you know, we've been concerned about debt and interest rates for a while. I've, uh, I've given up being the doomsdayer on federal debt and interest rates, and, uh, um, and, and, and we might be looking at where, where we're going to be in this sort of environment for a while, and we're probably maybe looking at if we have inter, uh, inflation, more of adjustment on the real side, which would, could, keep our, could keep our interest rates low and our asset values at the levels where we're at. So we got another poll question here. Uh, where do you expect soybean prices to be in five years? And again, if you wouldn't, uh, there, there, in, if you would answer that for, for me, uh, we have a question. Is there a guidance in citing the graphs? These, the data from those graphs come from the uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. They have a, uh, a data, a, or data service available called FRED. And right now I can't think of the acronym for FRED, but uh, give me a little time and I'll think about that. So we're, uh, we're, we're now looking at uh, asking you the question of where do you think soybean prices are, are going to be at five years from now? So continue to answer that, that question. 63% of you have voted. Um, we have uh, 220 four people on this webinar at the, this point in time, so you'll get a feel for, uh, for where we're at. We're gonna close this poll right now, bring up the results, and 30% of you believe it's over $11 per bushel, 35% be, believe 10 to 11, and 31% believe eight to nine or, uh, uh, <laughs> so we got a third, a third, a third here. So those of you that believe it's over eleven dollars per bushel, you're not going to see anything on the, the, um, the, the, the demand side that probably causes our, us concern for for farmland prices. If you're in that ten to eleven bushel dollar per acre uh, area, you'd probably be a bit more sluggish. If you're below ten, uh, we could see some, some. We would see downward pressure on both cash rents and down uh, land prices. We're gonna end up today with just a little, ah, thank you. Jim has helped me out here. Fred, Federal Reserve Economic Data. So there you go. Uh, uh, Jim Baltz gave me that information. So there's a, uh, we have, ah, uh, uh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was one of our listeners who gave it to, to, to Jim. So we appreciate, we appreciate our uh, commenters here. So. Um, thank you for, for keeping us honest here and with information. Just a couple of comments on cash rents and rental arrangements. Uh, we do have leasing arrangements available on our Farm Doc website. If you want to see uh, uh, our crop share, a fixed cash rent, a short firm for one year, and a longer term lease, uh, those are available. And again, if you're doing leasing, we would suggest that the written lease is the best. Uh, just just so um, having those things in writing is always a, a, a good, good, good item. And I get a lot of calls where there isn't a written lease and then there are questions about how to proceed. And if there had been a written lease, we wouldn't have those questions. In Illinois, if you don't have a written lease, October 31 is the notification date. That is for Illinois. That will vary across the across this country. That's a Illinois law, so that's not applicable to other states. And just so we know, most leases are one-year leases or year-to-year -year leases, um, particularly if you have cash rent uh, 
thinking about setting up a, a more longer than that particularly anything over two or three years just becomes problematic because we don't really know where our economy will be we're looking at the lease types and this this is about where we're at now, cash rent is the number one, 42%. Share rent, 23%. Variable cash rent, where cash rent varies with crop revenue, is 19%. We also have share rent with modifications, 10%, and then custom farming is 6%. Those, uh, those, uh, those uh, percentages are what are reported by the Illinois Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. They may vary slightly if you look at the at, at different sources for that information. Again, though, we see uh, for cash rents as being the predominant lease, and again, that will vary across 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 the state. We typically see more cash rent in northern Illinois than in central and southern Illinois, and we also see with those share rental arrangements. Uh, uh, Tip with some some of those about nine percent have a supplemental rent and those typically are in the twenty to thirty dollar per acre range. Our Illinois Society this year's had an average of twenty nine percent. So that'll give you a feel for where we're at there. Here's what those average cash rents and this was a debt that's this was released at the end of August. Um, what USDA is say, saying those uh, cash rents are. Um, $311 was the high. That happens to be in Macon County, but you can see this the central Illinois region uh, having the highest cash rents and then those going getting lower from as we move down. Overall, most of those rents uh, were up from the previous year. We had some counties where we had lower lower rents that probably is more statistical measurement issues than anything else. If you average those cash rents together and look at them on a regional basis, here's what those regions are. Again, this would be for USDA reported and overall we see rents up over, over most of the regions of Illinois. We do have an example of a variable lease and, and that was given in, in the August 10th, 2021 uh, leasing article, we would suggest parameters, then this would be for Central Illinois, $200 per acre, rent factors of 32 and 43% for corn and soybeans, and how those rent factors would work is if you had a revenue, market farm yield times market price gives you revenue. If you take the rent factor, in this case, if you're looking at corn, 990 times 32%, you take that times the percent of acres, if, if those rent factors result in a higher rent, there's an additional payment. Uh, more detail on that is given in our August 10th, 2021 article. Just gonna, uh, Todd, we would like to thank our sponsors. Yes, we would. Yeah, we have so a new that, one, Corteva. Yeah, so we added that to our list of the, today. We appreciate Corteva. We haven't made the official announcement of that yet, but uh, we will do, be doing that soon. Yeah, so... Uh, we have several folks that we would like to thank. They include the TIA Center for Farmland Research, uh, which is right there on the third floor. Uh, Mumford Halper Sherry has that up, and you can always find it at farmland.illinois.edu, along with Compere Financial, Corteva AgroSciences, Farm Credit, Illinois, uh, the Illinois Soybean Association, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, Growmark, the Gardner Policy Agriculture Policy Program here on campus, and of course, the Department of Agricultural Consumer Econo and, and Consumer Economics in the College of ACES. I think there was one question that we do need to follow up on, uh, Gary. That was about how you might go about citing some of the graphics if they would use them, and whether that's yeah. allowed. Yep, you're allowed to cite those. We generally did give the uh, the the source of the source of the the data in the uh, in in the graph itself. The ones that were de dealing with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, with the debt and interest payment data came from Fred, our Federal Reserve source, and. Uh, 
How's uh, Todd's at the Farm Progress Show today? How's it going out there? You know, we're having a really good day here at the Farm Progress Show, and it's been a great week, frankly. There are a number of folks, a lot of folks here actually today on this last day. It's always a lighter day on Thursday, but uh, I've made note uh, that folks have come out. I was talking to one of uh, your Department of Base grads, Matt Bennett, earlier. He'll be on the closing market report this afternoon and has been uh, making presentations at the Case IH tent. Uh, hour-long presentations, and he says farmers have been sitting down uh, to talk about uh, the grain markets there with him. Speaking of which, when we look forward, Gary, uh, we will have a grain market outlook coming up. That's not next week. That'll be on uh, the 16th of September. Scott Irwin and Joe Jansen will do that one, and Carbon Markets is next week. I think uh, that'll be interesting. You, along with Krista Swanson and Sarah Sellers. We'll take that up. So kind of looking forward. I bet that's been an interesting one to begin to prepare for, Gary. Uh, have you started in on work with that one? Yes, we have. We've actually given a number of presentations on that. I would also, if you look at our five-minute farm doc dailies, we have a number of those that deal with the so, so, soil carbon. By the way, we've switched those. Uh, our, if you were looking at the at, at at the at those uh, web webinars, um, we switched uh, the grain markets and the carbon markets around primarily oh. because we were doing it the next day. The next day was release of all the reports, so that seemed like bad timing. So, oh um, right, right. So okay. So, in that vein, I guess we're done for the day. We thank you for taking your time with us. Uh, and we do appreciate it. Remember, this is always archived on the Farm Doc website, and you can find it. Just go to Farm Doc or Farm Doc Daily. Illinois.edu. If you want to be involved in those other webinars that are cup coming, you're already signed up. You'll get an email about them. Uh, do send it along to other folks you think might be interested. Uh, we would be uh, glad to have more on with us. I want to take time to thank. Uh, Jim Baltz, who's behind the scenes, and Luke Worrell, of course, too. Luke, thank you for joining us, uh, for putting this program on today. And Gary Stickey, thank you, too. We appreciate everyone who's taken the time to join us here for this Farm Doc Daily webinar. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason from the Farm Progress Show, wishing you the best of day.